If you are an aging millennial, such as myself, you might have wasted away many weekday, weekend nights watching Adult Swim on Cartoon Network. While other teens were out there being cool, having drugs, and doing sex, I was wasting my years of youthful bliss watching cartoons at midnight. Adult Swim was a block of shows that used to run after dark when the parents were asleep. Hell yeah! And make sure you have the mute button ready for when that introduction comes. Parents strongly caution, the following programs are intended for mature audiences over the age of 18. These programs may contain some material that many parents would not find suitable for children and may include intense violence, sexual situations, coarse language, and suggestive dialogue. Intense violence, sexual situations, coarse language, and suggestive dialogue? Oh, hell yeah, sign me up! Cartoon Network was the best channel of my childhood. I don't know what they're doing now, I'm sure it's fine, don't care. But as a kid, it was king, right next to a close second of Nickelodeon. None of that corny Disney Channel bullshit for me, nuh uh, I wanted action, bitch, and I got it with motherfucking Denami. Then as I graduated high school, so did the shows that I tuned into. Because there was anime on Adult Swim as well. It wasn't just Family Guy and Futurama rotting away at my brain cells. The anime on Adult Swim was a minor step up from your standard shonen that was on Toonami. I'm talking shows, yes, of course, like Cowboy Bebop, Wolf's Rain, Ghost in the Shell, Standalone Complex, all those great classics. But one is the subject of today's video. And that's Fooly Cooly. These uh, covers, by the way, are uh, interchangeable. Like you can, oh, you can scratch up your DVD. That's a great feature. And then you can uh, change, rotate the cover. And I personally prefer the alternative colors because I am a special little snowflake. In my previous video, I reviewed and watched Garden State, which is also a coming-of-age story. And in that video, I basically talk about how that movie didn't hold the same magic for me as it did when I was younger. However, with Fooly Cooly, the magic has stayed, and I still love and cherish this series. It's safe to say that this show has a special place in my heart and most likely will stay there until I am D.E.D. -E -D dead. The first episode begins with Nauta hanging by a artificial riverbank, doing homework and hanging out with his brother's ex-girlfriend, Mamimi. This scene right away establishes the setting of the show, which is the city of Mabase, which is a town that... Nothing amazing happens here. Everything is ordinary. <sighs> oh boy, that line. That line was special for me, and most likely a lot of other people, because I feel like it's this natural thing as an adolescent to hate your hometown, and I was no different, so I felt exactly the way Nauta did. However, for Nauta, he is oh so very wrong, because in moments his world is flipped upside down when Haruko arrives. The fragile piece he once knew is savagely broken by Haruko's bass guitar as she bashes his head with it. And thus begins a series of strange events. Shortly after this, a bump begins to protrude from Nauta's head, and it's very obviously a reference to popping a boner. There's no way you can't tell me this isn't a boner joke. Haruko suddenly moves in as a housekeeper and reveals that she's an alien. Quite nonchalantly, too. I'm an alien. An officer from the Galactic Space Patrol Brotherhood, to be exact. And she doesn't follow the Prime Directive in any sense. She's all manic pixie, no dream girl. In fact, she's a downright fucking nightmare. Stay right there. I'm gonna make you feel all better. This episode focuses on establishing her character the most, 
She's a bit like Masato if she wasn't the best girl and more psychopathic. So maybe nothing like Masato at all, but I think you know what I mean. Another thing that they establish here is Nauta's brother, who is never really on screen except for in the form of a shadow. He recently moved to the United States to play baseball professionally. For Nauta, he was a role model. For Mamimi, he was her everything. Mamimi spends the majority of the series finding replacements for him and nicknaming them all Takun because Nauta's brother's name was Taksukun. This shot perfectly reflects her mindset after losing Nauta's brother. She's given up on life and believes that there is no future. She has a breakdown upon hearing that he has an American girlfriend, and this triggers Nauta's first N.O. Now you may be wondering, asking yourself, what is N.O.? In the world of Fooly Cooly, N.O. is the ability to pull objects from faraway star systems. They use both sides of the human brain to create a portal, and that is called N.O. I personally believe that N.O. stands for nothing because no one knows what it stands for. N.O. No. No one knows what it stands for. And given the logic of this series, or the lack thereof, I say I'm right on the money. A robot emerges from Nauta's head in the middle of a struggle against another robot that only gets an arm out before the portal is closed. He is glowing red during his first appearance, which means he is channeling the powers of Atomisk. I will tell you who that is, don't worry. After Haruko strikes him with her guitar, his colors fade to a bluish green. Atomisk is a being, a possible deity, who is known as the Pirate King. His levels of N.O. are so immense they can steal entire star systems. Atomisk is more of a MacGuffin character than anything. Uh, it's more of a presence than a personality. And it is while Conti is red that he is channeling his power and thus the ideal man. When he is in his blue-green form, he's just another schlob like the rest of us. In fact, Conti does indeed just become another dude helping out at the bread shop owned by Nauta's family. You call that bread? The second episode focuses more on Mamimi and is aptly titled Firestarter. She's aimless, prone to destructive habits, such as smoking and committing arson. Arson, arson! For such a tragic figure, she does behave surprisingly chipper, but make no doubts about it. She's got some battle scars, dude. Mamimi is a very lonely person, and to show this, she is seen obsessively playing a handheld game. A lot of handheld games tend to be singular experiences. This isn't like a Switch or anything with Wi-Fi. This loneliness distorts her views on reality, and she sees Conti as a god. I can see him, he's really real. In fact, naming him after the god of Black Flame from the video game itself. Haru-san, you shouldn't do this. Don't you know that Conti's a god? What's she on about? Oh, it's some video game. It's not just a game. Another strange horn is protruding out of Nauta's head. This one is a little less phallic. There seems to be a connection with the robots coming out of his head and the medical mechanical factory that Haruko is trying to figure out. And, of course, so are we. The Medica Mechanica Factory is a mysterious corporation that operates factories across the galaxy. Like most corporations, they're shady and possibly tied to the government. I mean, how can you trust a building that doesn't have an entrance or an exit? It's like a retail job. I also love that Haruko uses a Gundam to fix her Vespa. It kind of gives you a hint that this Vespa really isn't a normal Vespa. Nauta and his friends visit the ruins of a recent fire on their way home, and Mimi is seen in the river. One of his friends talks about how she has been bullied by students at her school, smoke rises from the factory, and Nauta puts two and two together, figuring out Mamimi is responsible for their fires. She reveals this as well as confessing to burning down her old school, and another robot emerges from Nauta's head. This one is curiously missing an arm, so I believe it's the other half of the robot from the previous episode. 
Haruko and Kanti fight it until Nauta is consumed. This activates Kanti's superpowered red mode, which allows him to transform into an anti-tank rifle that destroys the villain of the day. Shortly after being used, Nauta is pooped out and then promises to stay by Mamimi's side. What's he talking about? He wrote a whole book on the deep mysteries of Eva. Episode 3 focuses on a background character introduced in the previous two. Nina Mori is a part of Nata's Gain of Friend, along with those two other guys. I don't know their names off the bat, but I'm sure they have them. Her parents are important people. Her father is the mayor of the city and in the middle of a scandalous divorce. Nina Mori does a better job of acting like a grown-up than Nauta, with her ability to devour curry without flinching. However, she is still a victim of the after effect. After effect. Restroom? Over there. She's lied and cheated her way to get the lead role of a school play in the hopes that it would bring her parents together some way. Much like the character of the school play, she lived the lie and deceived herself into thinking she was more mature than she actually is. Near the finale, she finally embraces her emotions. All he needs to do is say what he really feels. That's what I did, then I cried and stuff. Huh? To who? To my mother and father. Father? So she actually does grow as a person. To me, this episode overall is about accepting adults as flawed beings. I think every one of us has a moment in adolescence when we realize that adults aren't the golden gods that we thought them to be for so long. You know, we come to learn that there really is no way to be an adult. You're, you're, you're an adult, and that's it. Like, everyone's just winning it. The robot fight in this episode is memorable for being more comedic than action-oriented. There's even this rollicking classical number that plays in the background, and it is defeated by eating a bowl of curry. It ate Taco's curry! Episode 4, Full Swing, is also known as the episode that you don't want your parents to overhear. Uh, not so hard! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In the opening, Nauta is playing baseball poorly. He's no replacement for his brother. However, Haruko has joined the opposing team, giving them a guaranteed victory through violence. The losing baseball team bitches and moans about how they need their own star player to turn things around for them. Instead of solving their own problems, they're waiting for Superman to save the day, which is found with Conti. This relates very much with the themes of this episode. Nauta's dad, who, by the way, his name is uh, Kumon. Kamun? Kamun. His name is Kamun. Monchon. Is acting strangely, more strangely than usual. And whatever he's doing with Haruko, it triggers jealousy in Nauta. While taking his frustrations out on a vending machine with his baseball bat, he meets Commander Amaro, a special agent at the Bureau of Interstellar Immigration. Those eyebrows. Those eyebrows. Eyebrows. They perfectly represent his character. He projects this strong, masculine image, but it's a very flimsy facade. In fact, he is an adult who still wants to grow up. Nauta would end up very much like him if it wasn't for the events of the show. A satellite damaged from one of Haruko's stray baseballs begins its deadly descent into the city of Mabase. The double entendres here are too good not to share. Hey, I didn't know boys felt like this inside. Ah, don't touch me there from behind! <laughs> Ah, if I rush, it won't pop! Go slow! Ah. Unlike the baseball team hoping for a miracle, Nauta takes initiative, and he swings the bat. However, it's not enough, and Haruko jumps in at the last second and sends the bomb flying back into space. It's important to see Nauta taking a step closer to maturity. When the chips are down, there are few that can swing the bat, and Nauta has proved that he can make his own decisions instead of letting them be made for him. What about eyebrows? In episode 5, this is my personal favorite episode of the series because of the animation direction by Hiroyuki Imashi. 
He has directed amazing shit like Kill a Kill and Girl a Gone and my personal favorite movie of all fucking time, Dead Leaves. Hell yes, I love that fucking movie. You can recognize his style immediately with the opening of the show, with the chaotic breakneck pacing that he's known for, and this tone works perfectly for the episode. This episode centers around Nauta's ego, which could be another erection metaphor, because after the events of all these previous episodes, Nauta is starting to think that he's a, he's a badass. So it's like you're the pilot, like a robot commander or something. <laughs> is that true? You're really the commander, Nauta? That's awesome! <laughs> it's true. Even Mamimi starts to notice that he's acting differently, especially around Haruko. She is seeing herself become less and less important to him and his life. When did you start to change and grow up and everything, Taku? Nauta, he denies this at first, he's trying to act normal and mature, but succumbs to his ego, which is the opposite of maturity. His ego causes a major problem that becomes a giant mech that is tearing up the town. However, at the end of this episode, he does own up to his problem, and finally divorces himself from the shadow of his brother and claim his own identity. Kanji! Now listen, my name is Nauta! Don't ever call me Takun again! I always feel that moment, just... Mm. The giant mech takes the form of a giant hand and sets up the climax. Oh, don't I get one of those candies? I want to get the sweetest one. Super sweet, if you know what I mean. The flat climax. I do appreciate, however, that they did put that pun in the show. It would be wasted if they didn't. Oh boy, what a climax it is. After the events of the previous episode, Haruko and Kanti have disappeared as wanted criminals, no less. Meanwhile, Mamimi adopts a stray robot that grows whenever it eats electronic equipment. Surely, that's nothing to worry about. Haruko reunites with Nauta in another amazing manga sequence. They share a tearful moment that melts my goddamn heart, like butter in the microwave. The two run away together, and it's kinda cute, not gonna lie. Meanwhile, Mamimi is on a rip-roaring rampage of revenge with her cute little puppy. Oh my god! Before I get into the ending, I want to say that Kamon despite being a immature adult and a lousy father, occasionally spits out an insightful gem here or there, such as when Nauta's school teacher visits due to his absence. Unlike that hamster, Nauta's enjoying his freedom. That doggo Mamimi took under her broken wing is actually known as the terminal core. This piece was knocked out in the previous episode, but unbeknownst to her, she nursed it back to health and it merges with the giant hand. Now get this, Medica Mechanica's master plan is to use the power of Atomisk in order to activate their iron-shaped factories across the galaxy to flatten out the wrinkles of the brain and thus eliminate thought. Yeah, this show's weird. I love it. The giant hand reaches towards the factory to begin this nefarious plot, but is stopped when Nauta emerges with the powers of Atomisk. Haruko flies into a jealous fury, because acquiring his power has been her number one goal this whole time. However, Nauta surrenders to confess his undying love. And yeah, it, it's fucking cute. I love you. Adam Misk is unleashed in his final form from Nauta's head as a motherfucking red bird big enough to be a kaiju. The godlike being then takes off with the terminal core before Haruko can absorb him. She prepares to leave shortly after in order to follow him, but asks Nauta if he would like to take a lawn before she thinks the better of it. Cause you're still a kid, Takun. Save it for next time. As selfish as she is, I feel like she did develop a soft spot for the boy. Thankfully, she is sensible enough not to bring him into space. In the epilogue, we find out Mamimi also grows as a person, starting as someone who was hopeless about the future, and now has decided on a goal to be a photographer. Good for her. 
Nauta and his friends progress to junior high, and Normalcy returns to Mabase. The series closes with a now contradictory statement. Nothing amazing happens here. Everything is ordinary. And no, we never find out the meaning of Fooly Cooly. What does Fooly Cooly mean? I don't know. So, would I recommend this series? Absa fucking lootly. Coming of age stories hit differently when you are coming of age yourself. I totally get that, but whenever I watch this anime every year, there is still something about it that speaks to me each time. So, I feel like it does hold up and will absolutely 10 out of 10 recommend this for everyone. I just want to say that I'm wearing short shorts underneath the camera because it is a hot as ball summer day and I do not live with oh, air conditioning. You know what my air conditioner is? It's this $20 piece of shit from fucking CBS. That's my goddamn air conditioner. Now, since my first exposure to this show was on cable TV, that means, yes, that it was dubbed. I do not have a strong preference in the rivalry between subbed versus dubbed. However, I tend to lean towards subs because I am one. <laughs> the English dub for this show, however, is immaculate. It's outstanding. It's a goddamn piece of art. The original director even has complimented the performances of the English cast and how well they match the energy of their Japanese counterparts. There was also a ton of references to Japanese pop culture that the English writing team had to do a hell of a job at finding the right equivalents and replacements, and they made it work completely. Like filter or slash, like red hot chili peppers or razor ah, in the machine or Richard Cheese! There's one that doesn't fit the list, you know. However, yes, some of those pop culture references are going to age poorly. I said to get the one with the Anna Nicole centerfold. Can't you get anything right? But I think that is just what happens with pop culture references. Time stops for no one and marches onward. So eventually that pop culture reference is just going to be irrelevant. And that's just something that happens with the medium. However, the real reason why I want to talk about this dub is because of some of the fun things that I found out while doing my research and extensive Googling for this video. Not one, but two of the American voice acting cast had roles on another show, maybe you've heard of it, I don't know, called Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Barbara Goodson, who voiced Nauta in Fooly Cooly, also was in the role for Rita Repulsa. Ah! After 10,000 years, I'm free! It's time to conquer Earth! And Dave Mallow did the voice for this blueberry motherfucker, was Commander Amaro. And yes, you heard that last name correctly, folks. Dave Mallow. Hmm, that kind of sounds familiar. It's almost like that's my last name, too. Well, I don't know if we are truly related or not, but that didn't stop me from using that small connection to send out an email and contact him. This was years, by the way, before my YouTube channel was even a thing. I just asked him if he would answer a few questions of what it was like to work on the show Power Rangers, and he was more than happy to fulfill my fandom desires. The more we got to talking, though, I started to feel that he wasn't just making my day by doing this. I was sort of making his because I was acknowledging his work and appreciating it. I even complimented his performance on Commander Amaro because when I found that out, I just, I just had to say something. And he said that he doesn't get really uh, as much compliments on that particular role, which surprised me considering the cult following behind this program. So that's really what I wanted to talk about when it comes to the dub. That's it. <laughs> that's, that's all I really have to say of it. 5 out of 5, 10 out of 10, gold stars all around. And honestly, if you are moved by a voice actor's performance, don't hesitate to send an email out to them. Just complimenting them, because I'm sure they would appreciate it. It would be impossible 
for me not to mention the music of this show. Fooly Cooly simply wouldn't be the same without the soundtrack provided by Japanese alternative rock band The Pillows. Their music is so integral to the show in the same way that Cowboy Bebop wouldn't hit the same without Yoko Kano. In fact, having her on board is one of the reasons why I am cautiously, cautiously optimistic for the Netflix ad adaptation. Also, John Cho can get it. John Cho. More like John can choke me, daddy. Sorry, don't mind me being thirsty. Is it just me or is it hot in here? Lord. Can you read that? It says come. Music. Pillows. The show's director, Kazuya Tsurumaki, wanted to use music from the pillows, so he contacted them, and they were hesitant at first because anime was outside their realm of knowledge. They kind of just know the typical grind of writing songs, recording albums, touring. <laughs> and grind, these guys do. These guys do grind harder than any RPG out there because they have 21 studio albums. That ain't nothing to scoff at. I don't have 21 studio albums, do you? At the time, being tied to a product didn't fit the vision of what they wanted for the band, but they submitted their latest single anyway, which was Ride On Shooting Star, and that became the closing theme for the show. The guitarist and singer Yoshiaki Manabe later reflected on how glad they were that they went with this show and how it brought them a lot of fans, especially from America, and how personally connected their music has become to the show. Really, there is no better gateway to the pillows than Fooly Cooly, and not only the pillows, but also just a lot of great Japanese rock music in general. And next thing you know, you're checking out Gat or Larkin Seal. Band made. Another song worth mentioning would be Little Busters because it plays at the end of just about every damn episode. So clearly there's something important about it. There's something that they want to communicate with this song, and I believe that's found in the English lyrics. With the kids seen out the future, maybe kids don't need the masters, just waiting for the little busters. The message here seems to be the kids are all right, uh, much like Whitney Houston said. Teach them and let them lead the way. And it's incredible that the song was made way before the show even existed because it fits the themes of the show perfectly. So if you don't even watch this show, even after watching this video, at least give the pillows a listen. Their music is like a pizza with all the fixins and leaves everyone satisfied. And that is my thoughts, uh, feelings, and recollections of this wonderful anime series. If you liked this video, there's definitely some more you can check out. Please do. As always, a special shout out to my boy, Bill Radovich, for being a true believer, as well as to all my other Patreons as well. Thank you for keeping the dream alive, and I'll see you next time.